So good. I can't wait to hear Scott Vanderwerf preach to a group of men. Come on. So excited. Hey, I asked somebody to share tonight a little bit more about Maine men, building off of what Nick was talking about. So Angelo, I don't know where you're at. There he is. Real men hug. Had to. All right. Had to. So uh, about an hour ago or two hours ago, I, I, I guess it, there we were in the middle of the 4 o'clock service at two hours ago. So this afternoon, I asked Angelo to just share a little bit about Maine Men and its impact on him, just to encourage you men that maybe you haven't been to a Maine Rumble and you're like, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, and so I've asked Angelo to share for a couple minutes about Maine Men and how it's impacted his life. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. So my name is Angelo. Uh, I've been coming to grow for a while. Um, Maine Men, when Pastor Joss asked me, to, asked me to share, what I immediately thought of is Maine Men is one of those times that actually gives me an opportunity to take a second and ask myself how things are going. Um, and just one example, if you're a guy in the room, you probably have heard the story, but uh, sometime last year, one of these things that you know, kind of came up in my life that I didn't give myself time to think about was, I was playing with my son Jasper, I've got five, uh, three sons, five, three, and one, and I was playing with Jasper, and just kind of out of nowhere, he goes, Dad, why do you hate being a dad? I mean, my heart is pounding in my chest just thinking about that right now, and just... I love being a dad. It's one of my greatest joys. It's one of my greatest just things in life. And uh, just didn't really know what to do with it right then. I was like, you know, because we weren't fighting. We were playing, you know, just playing. And uh, so I kind of just stuffed it down. And at one of these events, um, I talked to one of the guys and brought it up. And, and he goes, oh, man, that's so good. The enemy just showed you his hand. Like he, you, you know exactly what to do now. And so every single night now, I pray over the boys like, I love you. I love being a dad. I love being your dad. I love being with you and doing stuff with you. And so just like being able to encourage them every single time. And just that's what main men is. It's, it's a time where I get to take and some of those things that I didn't have a chance to deal with in the moment, yeah. they come up and I get to deal with them. And just it's amazing. And that was life changing. So. Oh, I love it. It's so good. Just as, as a group of men, we come together. And you know what? Most men's ministries are all about sin-focused and not doing bad things. Is that right? Like, let's take the five-step journey to freedom, and what are you doing wrong? <laughs> and as we believe as a group of men that our yes gets to be greater than our no. Amen? <laughs> and that as men, we get to actually step into biblical masculinity where we get to start rejecting passivity. It's actually Jesus' masculinity. That's what Maine is about. We're getting fascinated with Jesus as a man and going, you're the most masculine man to ever live. I want to be just like you as a man. So I want to encourage you, if you're a man, if you haven't come to a rumble, come on Wednesday. It's going to be great. And you can invite, like Nick said, you can invite your friends that don't go to Grove. We have plenty of room. We just pack in there, and we always have a good time, okay? All right, let's turn in our Bibles to John 15. John 15. We're all excited about that. That's how I feel, too. If you'll look in my Bible, I've got, like, all these notes, right, and colors, and half of the notes are just uh, theologically, doctrinally incorrect, probably. <laughs> I'm, like, 19, just scribbling the notes, you know. How many of you know that we just get to be humble followers of Jesus? We never graduate into perfect doctrine and theology, amen? We're always in process. So tonight we're looking at John 15, and, and it's building off of what God has spoken to us as a community. How many of you guys were at church a couple weeks ago when Pastor Katie and I announced we're, we're going into Family First in a new way? Do you remember that? Come on, okay, seven of you were in the house. I'm so glad a lot of you guys have an assignment. The assignment is if you weren't there two weeks ago, please listen to the message from two weeks ago 
it helps give context to why we closed down the 8 p.m. service and why we're crammed in here right now. And so uh, if you're hot and you're sweaty and you didn't listen to that message, you need context <laughs> for, for what you're feeling right now. And so, but what we talked about was we feel like God is inviting us into this slingshot moment as a family, as a church family. And when we, when we set out to start Grove, it, it really happened to us. God just, he tricked us, and now there's a church, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so we never set out to grow a church big. We never said, oh man, we would really be successful if we became a mega church. If we got a thousand people, then we made it, and then we're successful, and we're, we really did a good job. No, I believe that God has invited us into something more, into empowering everyday believers, everyday people like you and me, falling in love with God and not trying to do a program, not trying to, to be the next big thing, but being a people that knows him being a people that is committed to one another. So then when the, the junk hits the fan, there's actually a family to carry it, a family to actually step in. I believe that we have this voluntary hedged in moment, this voluntary pulling back that we're stepping into. And we're not trying to grow a church, we're trying to step into growing as a people. I believe that's, what, that's our invitation. What if we as people stepped into growth? And so John 15 is what I'm wanting to talk about tonight. We're going back to the basics. Everybody say basics. Basics. Back to the basics. We're, some of us might go, man, I really want a new revelation. I, you're the shepherd of the flock, so feed me. Feed me a new revelation, pastor. And tonight, I had to break the news to you. I'm not preaching any good revelations. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not giving you anything new. I just am giving you the basics tonight. Because I believe as we're pulling back, I want to get really simple. What if we just go back to the basics of what Jesus taught us? We never graduate from the basics. We never graduate from humility. We never graduate from serving. We never graduate into... into uh, beyond the gospel, like, oh, I'm really into healing and signs and what, by the way, if you weren't here last week, <laughs> Katie and I weren't here last week, we were in Mexico, and so as we were in Mexico, we're, we're in our hotel room, we have Facebook Live on, we're tuning in to watch, and then Facebook Live crashes, and it's like this morning, it's like weeping and gnashing of teeth, we're like, no! We're just so excited to be joining with you guys, and we couldn't. So, but last night, if you weren't here, or last week, uh, the message was on healing, and it was a lab night, and you have to go listen to the message. It was powerful. So many people got healed last week. How many, what, 10, 10, 10 to 15 each service? Come on. So awesome. So if you're, if you're wondering, you're going like, what? Oh, I don't believe that God does that. Or Go listen to the message. It's so powerful. And it's so good. Okay. We're going to get into the Bible. Before we get into the Bible. Okay. So do you want to throw up the Grove uh, slide here? Yes. Oh, it was already up. Okay. <laughs> Have any of you guys ever wondered what that circle with the two X's is? You're like, what the heck is that? Makes me feel a little weird. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, this, this is our icon or our logo as a church. And what it represents is the two X's represent this thing called the times two lifestyle. The times two lifestyle. In other words, you were never meant to have a boring life. You were always meant to live a life that would be multiplied. You were always meant to have your life actually spread and multiply and be fruitful in all of everyday life, all right? And so the cross, the, it's two X's times two, get it, okay? And then there's crossover. Our lives are always meant to cross over with God. 
that we're supposed to actually lay our lives down the same way that Jesus laid his life down on the cross is how we're supposed to live. And we get to live. And then the circle represents it all happens in community. It all happens in this circle of family. And that's what we get invited into in this family first season for us as a church. So, John 15, verse 7. Say amen if you're there with me. Amen. Amen. All right. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Everybody say, up, out, in. Up, out, in. Up, out, in. We're going... We're going to be talking about the basics of what it means to live a fruitful life tonight. The basics of what it looks like to follow Jesus. This is the the broad overarching elements of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what the lifestyle of following Jesus looks like. And the first thing that I want to talk about is this up element of our life with God. So up is talking about our relationship with God in is talking about our relationships with those that are intimate in our, in our families, our friends, the people that are closest to us that know Jesus. And the out is us reaching the world. It's us living on mission in everyday life, okay? So all of your life as a follower of Jesus is up, out, in, or up, out, in. <laughs> My message tonight, I have to, this is so funny, the 4 p.m., I've ordered my message up, in, out. The screen says up, out, in. So just, can, you, can, or can we adjust? Are we okay? Some of you guys are like, no, my night's ruined. Do it in order. The screen says it, and I'm not going to. I'm sorry. Okay. So up, our up relationship, our vertical relationship with God. Jesus is talking about it, and in verse 7, he says this. If you abide in me, in my words, abide in you. He's talking about if you're meditating on my words, my truth, my message, the word of God. That's part of your relation, your up relationship. The question is tonight, and and before I get into some of the questions I'm going to ask of us, I want to encourage you, don't be the exception. When I say, like, How is your Bible reading? And you say, well, that's a good word, Pastor, but you don't apply it to your life, and you're like, I'm not going to ask myself that question. I want to encourage you to actually go, like, look at your life. Look at your life, because the only way that you can take ground is if you face where you're at. And so we have to go, like, be real with ourselves. How am I really doing, okay? So if my words abide in you, it's talking about Bible study or meditating on truth. When's the last time that you read your Bible? Maybe some of us, it's, it's a couple weeks. Maybe some of us, it's months. Maybe some of it's a yesterday. That's awesome. I know that in my life, there's been seasons where I haven't read the Bible. And you're like, Pastor Josh, are you serious? <laughs> where I haven't read the Bible in like a couple months, three months maybe. And and so if you're feeling like, man, I feel so guilty, I didn't read the Bible, Pastor Josh, you can always remember, Pastor Josh didn't read the Bible for three months, and he was like the prayer Bible guy, okay? <laughs> There's seasons in our life where it's hard, and you're, you've got chronic illness in your family, and you're just trying to survive, and you're going, I just can't get up for air. And so in all of this message... There's no shame, guilt, or condemnation. We're all a people in process. Everybody say, everybody say, I'm in process. I'm in process. And so if you're starting to feel guilty when I'm asking these questions, then you have to be reminded of who you are in Jesus. That Jesus removed guilt from you so that you could actually be real and honest with where you're at. And you're going, I know who I am. I get to look at my life and not feel like I have to shrink back whenever I miss the mark. Amen? All right. 
So he's, he's going, I'm just laying this out. This is this upward relationship, Bible. Then right after that, he says, ask whatever you wish. When I hear that, I hear prayer, right? I hear conversation. I hear God, prayer, talking with one another, dialogue with God. Do you know when we're, when we're spending time with God, we can so easily get into religious mode, right? Do you feel connected with him, or have you been playing religion? I'm doing my devotions, I'm being a good boy, being a good girl. Or do you feel connected and near to him? Then we move forward. Verse 9 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Abide is, is this word that means dwell or make a home or remain. And he was saying, remain in my love. Make a home in my love. Do you feel happy in your heart when you're with him? When's the last time that you felt like, oh, I really enjoy my relationship with God? Do you enjoy him? When you spend time with him, do you enjoy each other? Or are you kind of indifferent? You're kind of like, oh, yeah, it's God. Kind of feel guilty. <laughs> kind of feel like I'm not measuring up. Kind of feel condemnation. But I really need to work hard. I haven't read my Bible in about a week, and he's probably a little frustrated. I'm a little disappointed in myself. And all along the way, he's like, let's enjoy each other. Yeah. Oh, I like you. I've been watching you every single day. I was seeing you eat Lucky Charms, and you're an adult, and that's weird, but I still love you. Right? I just called some of you out. All right. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 6. Ooh. Whoa. These people know their Bible for sure. Everybody's like, ew, Romans 6. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 11. Before we read that, I'm going to read back in John 15. So, tricked you. Okay, verse 11. Here we go. Or no, verse 10 in John 15. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So we see that Jesus, God in the flesh, is obeying the Father. He's obeying God. Romans 6, verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as though you have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but you're under grace." Man, that's some good news right there. I like that good news a lot. I want to read it again, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. <sighs> Obedience. We oftentimes think, I really could get filled up right now if I would just kind of do what I feel like doing, right? But then we, then we look at Jesus' life, and Jesus, he's at the well with the woman. And the disciples come back and they're like, Jesus, are you so hungry? You must be starving. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not hungry at all. I have food that is from my father. I, I don't have an appetite. I'm not hungry. I don't have hunger pains or anything like that. No low blood sugar, none of it, okay? And he says, he says, I'm not hungry because I'm doing the will of my father and it's food for me. I'm full. Do you want to live a fulfilled life? 
then you start walking in obedience to God. And I love in John 15, he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy would be what? Full. So he's saying a life that's full is a life where you're fully surrendered and you're joyfully walking in obedience, right? Romans 6, we just said that don't have your body be instruments of unrighteousness, but instruments of righteousness. Do you know what that means? That means your fingers, your fingernails, your, your forearms and your elbows and your belly button and every other part of you <laughs> is actually an instrument of worship before God. And when I'm talking about instrument, I'm talking about the electric guitars on stage. I'm, I'm just thinking about this going, okay, I'm not a gifted musician. When I sing, it can be a little weird. <laughs> my, my kids are like, Dad, stop. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> and maybe some of you are just like me, okay? And yeah, we got some like, hallelujah, that's me. Right? <laughs> okay. But listen, I wonder if your obedience, when it costs you something in the everyday, means more than your songs that you sing in services. I wonder if the strum of your obedience and the melody of your yes, as you say no to sin and yes to God, actually moves his heart a little bit more. I wonder if when you're standing before God and you see him face to face and you're going, oh, that sacrifice of the little yes in my heart to say no to sin and yes to you. And the Lord's like, yeah, that's this huge crown. And he's like, boom, boom. And you're like, oh, God, I can't carry it. And he's like, yeah, throw it at my feet. And you're like, yes. <laughs> what, if, what if it's the little yeses? What if it's the little yeses when no one is watching and you don't have worship in the background? Those little yeses of obedience out of love. See, we've made obedience and not sinning something so that we don't feel guilty. Or we've made it like, oh, I don't want to hurt anybody. And the Lord's saying there's a higher revelation of worship there's a higher revelation of living holiness, a set-apart life, sanctified. And that higher way is because you love me. Workers always get outworked by lovers. You were destined to be a lover. You were destined to worship out of love. That's something that the angels can't offer him. Only you. Only you, and the angels can't offer it because they see him, whereas you get, to, you get that one privilege. Nobody else gets that privilege in all of creation. You can't see him, and yet you love him. Oh, man, and you love him in secret, and the song of your obedience. Oh. Yes. Up, in, out. Don't look at the screen. Up, in, out. We're moving to in. This is how Jesus lived. Jesus prayed, he read the Bible, he meditated, he lived in obedience to God, and he dwelled and made a home in his love. You get to be, I always say this, you get to copycat Jesus. Just copycat him. That's what discipleship is. People copying other people. Up and out, we're going to in. Everybody say in. Jesus had friends. Is that right? Jesus had people close in his life. And so these intimate friendships, the question is, do you have intimate friendships? Do you have anybody in your life that really knows you, that really knows what's going on, that really knows, I don't think you're doing well, right? Hey, I'm seeing this. What's going on? Have you invited anybody into your life and made yourself vulnerable with them so that they could challenge you and ask you the hard questions? Is there anybody in your life that could say, hey, I, I don't know about that? 
Or have you surrounded yourself with enough walls to have really great relationships that are surfacey, but there's not anybody that really sees you underneath the surface? We were created to have friends that we go deep with. I believe that there's three different ways that we have in relationships in life. Everybody say three. Three. All right. Intimate relationships that are familial, like family, marriage, kids, close friends. That's like, the question is, as a spouse, how, how is your spouse doing? How is your marriage? Do you feel connected to your spouse? Sometimes couples go 10, 15, 20 years, and they never stop and go, are we connected? Does she feel known and loved and seen? Have we been cohabitating for so long that we're just kind of in this rut of just being around? What if we paused and went, I think there's something more. Intimate relationships, do my kids know that I love them, that I like them, that I'm proud of them? Do your kids, are your kids so confident that in your love that if somebody asked them, like, how do your parents feel about you, what would their response be? Do they have language for it because you've provided language and you've not only told them, but you showed them? And then there's, there's discipleship. So that's, we get to invest in other people and we get to be invested in. Do you have somebody that you're investing in? Do you have somebody that you're sowing into? Do you have somebody else speaking into your life that's a couple seasons ahead of you in the Lord? Next is, do you have accountability? We, talked about, uh, we talk about this at Maiden Men, but I'm just gonna talk about it right now really briefly. <laughs> Accountability, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, so it's a review, but I have to just hammer it home over and over again because we're so used to accountability as sin focus, right? Accountability in the kingdom is being accountable to who God has created you to be, who you were always meant to be in God, what righteousness looks like now that you're the righteousness of God. <laughs> it's not, okay, confess it all. Let's see. I want to hear it. No, it's let's take ground. Like this is what Jesus purchased. Now let's take steps in his promises into the promised land of life. He purchased promised land. Let's walk it and discover it and take ground together. That's what accountability is in the kingdom. Amen? All right, all right. So good. Do you have in relationships? Jesus had them. You get to have them. So it's the up, everybody say up, up. In. in, and out. 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 out is reaching, yes, out, <laughs> out, uh. out, verse 16, let's read it, verse 16, here we go, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. How many of us know that the, the way to reach the world is to actually love one another in the end of our life? Is that right? That's the blueprint. God says they're going to know you and know me by the way that you love each other. That's what we're stepping into as a family. Everybody in this room, either you're a guest and you're checking out Grove and you're kind of like, oh, do I want to make this my home? Or you've already put the stake in the ground and you're saying, yes, this is my home. So everybody in the room, will just say it, is family. And what we get to do and what we get to practice is to love one another. And I love that that's what that verse 17 closes with. And what's the fruit of love? The fruit of love is multiplication. When a man and a woman love each other, then there's a multiplication that takes place, and there's babies. Is that right? 
So everybody say, amen. amen. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in prayer, and I was just talking to the Lord, and, and out of nowhere, I just was overcome with this feeling or this emotion. And it was like I felt God groaning with this like ache from the throne room. And I got this picture in my mind's eye of, of God from the throne, and there's just this groan coming from the throne room. And, and he was just billowing with passion and zeal. And immediately I heard the phrase, where are all the babies? He was just crying out again and again, where are all the babies? And it was just this, this groan. And immediately I knew as I heard that phrase that he was talking about baby believers in the church. And he was saying, where are all the babies? There's so many children that have grown for so many years, but where are the babies? And I believe as a church community that we've put our stake in the ground of not really doing a lot of evangelism on Sundays in services. Is that right? I've even said from the pulpit, and I know this is crazy for guests. I'm, we're not crazy. We're kind of crazy, but we're not that crazy. <laughs> but I've even said, don't invite people that don't need, know Jesus to church. I've said that. Because I want, if you don't know Jesus, I want you to meet Jesus by going to your friend's house that knows him and going to the barbecue that they put together and hang out with them and you'll meet Jesus. Jesus isn't at the service. Jesus is actually inside of the people. And so the way to grow the kingdom is actually through the people of God, not the programs of, of God. Amen. So we've put all of our eggs in this basket of your life getting multiplied, your life being times two. The question is, is your life worth multiplying? Is your life worth following? I have to, we ask our, ourselves this question all the time. When life is happening in the everyday, and if, if somebody that didn't know Jesus was watching me, when I'm not, you know, dressed up in these really cool shirts and like, <laughs> you know? What is Josh like behind closed doors? What are you like behind closed doors? Do you have a life where somebody would look at it and go, whoa, that's different. That's like I just read in the Bible, and it's totally what my friend does. <laughs> really? If I believe God has put all of his eggs in this basket, too, in the people. He handed over. This is so foolish. It's like, what were you thinking, Jesus? He literally handed the whole kingdom over to 12 teenagers he, ho he handed the world and the world meeting God to 12 teenagers, except for Peter, who's a little older, but he's a crazy person. <laughs> and he said, this is my strategy, these guys, the guys that didn't make the team. And you think that you're disqualified. You think like, oh, he can't use me. I'm telling you this, maybe you're not hitting all, all cylinders and the up and the out and the in, and they're just like, you know, you're, you're going. But I'm telling you this, that let's go back to the simple things. Let's go back to the things that we'll never graduate from, like humility and love whispering with God when nobody's watching and praying and having a real relationship with him and, and maybe reading our Bible sometimes and actually talking to him about what you're reading. We're not gonna change the world with perfect people. It's, it's gotta be people in process. And 
and they'll see something different, even if you just mimicked, copycatted Jesus in his humility, it's totally other than, it's not even normal. It's totally like, what the heck was that? Wait, you've, you're vulnerable and authentic? That's not normal. Times two lifestyle. We are always created to bear fruit. The beautiful thing about fruit, it's not vegetables, it's fruit, right? Fruit have seeds in them. Is that right? There's always seeds in fruit. And he says, I want your fruit to abide. How are people going to abide if they get brought into the kingdom? How are they going to abide if they've never seen anybody abide? If we don't learn how to be present to his love and experience his love and dwell with him in his love and abide there, then we're never going to be able to show how to do it when somebody meets Jesus. And I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it for him. You're going to do it for him. Pastor Josh and Pastor Katie and all the other leaders and pastors in this community are not going to show them how to abide. That's your job. I mean, we can do some of that. That's great. Let's do it. But I'm telling you, you're their picture. And so you go, man, why do I need to read my Bible and pray? Why do I need to connect with God and be real with him? Because there's somebody that's going to watch you. Some type of baby is going to be watching you if you live with an out, if you live missionally, which you're always destined to. Worship team, you guys can come to the front. Some of us, maybe you're going, I I feel like I've got, I'm pretty good at up and in, right? Or maybe you're good, you're saying, I'm really good at in and out, or you're really good at out and up. The out and up people are the people that like are radical achievers, and they're going like, I'm going to kill this for God, I'm going to worship harder, I'm going to go on mission, and then they're totally burned out because they don't have any relationships, and they're isolated, and then in secret, when they totally screw everything up, then they have no support system, and they feel lonely because they weren't running with a crew. Then you have the people, oh, and then, and then they're the really good church leaders, the, the up and out people. They're like the really good leaders. They have a lot of people that are inspired by them. And then there's always failure of some kind because they don't have people in their lives. They're not loving their spouse well. They don't have a healthy heart and a healthy home, and it's all in balance, right? And then you have the people that are in the in and the out. So the people that are like, oh, I love, I love people. I love, I'm an extrovert. I love hanging out with people. And I'm very comfortable sharing my faith because it's fun. <laughs> They're just the party animals, right? They're excited. And then, and then they're, they don't have clarity on what they truly believe, but they are like crazy. They're like a lot of fun, but then they're not sure how God feels about them when they mess up. When they, they're insecure, but they cover up insecurity with people and relationships because they don't know how God feels about them because they're not abiding in him, right? And many of us are probably in the up and the in range, but without the out, right? We're like, man, I love my Bible. I love reading. I love praying. I love my small group. We study the Bible. It's so good. I got some revelations. The revelations are pretty awesome. (laughs) Pretty awesome revies, right? (laughs) And then you you're in comfort zone the whole time, right? And for 20, 30, 40 years, you're comfortable. And there's season after season where you start getting bored. And you're complacent, but you're just kind of bored. There's nothing more exhilarating than having relationships with people that don't know Jesus and loving them well. 
Like, I, actually, there's one thing that's more exhilarating than that, and that's encountering him, right? It's just being awakened to who he is. But next best thing is when you're just loving people that don't know him. It's so fun, especially when you don't feel the pressure of, like, I really got to save somebody today. Really got to go out and evangelize. Really got to hit the streets today. No, it's like... Oh, I'm just love. I've been abiding in him. I've got a crew. We want, we want a, a bigger family. Like, I want more people in my crew. <laughs> but the question is, does, does your crew want more people in your crew? Or are you running with people that are like, I'm really comfortable, just us. Why do we got to open it up to anybody else? I like, I like what we've got. Is that true or is that true? I know that is true. That's true for many of us, okay? Don't be that person that's like, I don't know if we should welcome them into our, our group. It's like, no, let's just have a barbecue and there, everybody's invited, right? The church can be one of the most clicky places in the world because we want to really make sure that we're all just... The, the right people are in the room, so we got that right feel. So we've got that like, hey, we're, we're all on the same page. <laughs> God's inviting us to have adoptive love. That's what Jesus, he hung on the tree and his arms were out like this. And all it was was adoptive love. Him revealing the father wants more kids in the family. Arms open wide. It's going to be a big family. I want more kids. My one and only son. Oh, I want your life to get multiplied. Jesus, I want you and your story of love to get multiplied billions of times over. Let's all stand. is our corporate slingshot moment as a church community. Our corporate slingshot season. We're not growing the church. There's no room to grow, and it's beautiful, and I love it. We're growing as a people. When there's no more room in the church building, what do you do? You invite people to your living room because you are the church. It's the strategy of Jesus, you being fruitful and multiplying. Amen? What I want to do, before we jump into worship, what I want to do is have a time of meditation for us as individuals where we just think about what's the area in my life where I'm really killing it in maybe one of these areas of up, out, in, right? So you're like, oh, man, I'm just doing so good at out. I'm just like killing it out. I'm living missionally. It's great. I'm sharing the gospel all the time. But let's meditate on what's one area out of the up, in, and out that we're, we're doing pretty good in, where we're seeing our strength. And then what's one area, what's one of these elements that we're going, you know what? I feel like God is highlighting this one. I feel like God is putting his finger on this area of my life. Can we do that? So we're just going to have a time of meditation. If you want to sit, stand, whatever, that's great. But before we do, let's all spread out throughout the room. We're going to go into a time of worship. So you can spread towards the front. You can spread towards the back now since there's room in the back and everybody's in the room. But whatever helps you to actually connect with the Lord. And then we're going to go into a time of worship. And so the worship team is going to lead us after a little bit. And you can just engage in however you would like as we go into worship. So Jesus, here we are. We thank you that you delight in us. We're your people in process, your children of promise. Lord, we thank you that you're not mad, sad, and angry, but you're the smiling God that's full of so much kindness and compassion and joy. We love you. 